Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. Overall questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on August 11, what to do when you see the red exclamation mark, resolving data problem errors, and family search family tree with Catherine Grant. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Baker, who will be giving a presentation on using MyHeritage DNA for segment analysis. Mr. Baker has been an active genealogist for the past 15 years. In 2011, he completed the Board for Certification of Genealogist requirements to become a board certified genealogist with a specialty in German genealogy research. He also specializes in Midwest, US, early American research and DNA. He was an officer of the Sacramento German Genealogy Society and contributed numerous articles to its quarterly publication, Der Bubamen. He also wrote articles for the National Genealogical Society magazine and the NGS Quarterly. He volunteered for over 10 years at the Sacramento Regional Family History Library. He has presented a total of nine webinars for Legacy Family Tree and for the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree communities. Beginning in 2012, he's given over 400 presentations to over 50 genealogy societies at local, regional, and national genealogy events. Mr. Baker earned a PhD in sociology and social psychology from the University of Utah. He is retired from an aerospace and business management career. In his work career, he consulted for many large companies, including Boeing, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon. He has been an adjunct professor of sociology at UCLA and USC. His most fun job was being the piano man at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. And James, if you're ready, we will turn the time over to you. Anna, are we ready? Is it my turn? Yep. I'll push a couple of buttons and we'll hope to do good things. Um, Let's see, I think that that's going to do it. There's your slideshow from the beginning. And here we are. So away we go. We are going to talk about analyzing individual segments today. And so just to be sure that we're all on the same page, let's talk about these segments because all the DNA companies use them. They measure on specific areas, specific segments of specific chromosomes, and they measure the length of a matching segment. They measure that length and the number of them, and then they calculate our centimorgan CM score for each of our matches. Now, the more second bullet, when we're matching somebody, the more the more segments the longer segments we add them up and of course that's what we get with higher scores to work with those segments we use a chromosome browser and that way we can we go right to the heart of things to see exactly where which segments which chromosomes where we're matching people and so that's really where it's at because that's sort of the, oh, you, know, you might call it the golden standard of, uh, of matching and measuring these uh, centimorgans. Now, when we get a bunch of people, at least three of us that are matching all of us on the same segment of the same chromosome, we call that a triangulated group because it, there's at least three of us. And then sometimes there might be four or six or 12 or 20, however many. But the big thing is 
we want to have at least three of us to be to, to be able to say, yeah, th this, this is real. And so because these people, all the matching people are all sharing the same DNA strand for that segment, they all presumably got that segment from the same specific ancestor who might be back there three, four, five, six, however many generations. On ancestry, they have that through lines concept. And they and what they do with through lines, of course, is that they pick out specific ancestors and they say, who are the people who, who like we do, we descend, maybe it's a different route, but, but we descend from that same person. And presumably it's because we ma had matching segments on the same chromosome. Now, today we are interested in defining some triangulated groups. And of course, we're going to think much like we did on with the through lines that each one of those groups has an originating donor three, four, five generations back. Now, if you begin looking at your big picture of all of your segments, all your chromosomes, all your matches, and you say, how many triangulated groups do you have? Well, these days, a lot of people have taken the test. We have a lot of matches. And typically, the big guys say that you have maybe with your 20 some chromosomes, you might have as many as 200 or so different triangulated groups on each side, mother's side, father's side. Now, some people will be bigger donors than others. If you go back five generations, there are still some of those ancestors who are prolific donors. And then there are some others that it seems like their DNA, the luck of the draw, it just got kind of wiped out. So that's, uh, that's kind of where it is. Now, the value today of looking at this kind of analysis is that if we identify these groups of matches, they all share membership in a single triangulated group. And that's going to greatly speed up our identification of many of our matches that maybe had lower scores and were more difficult to deal with. To do this, MyHeritage has an especially useful tool. Now, some of the other sites, they have tools as well. Uh, FTDNA has a browser. Uh, uh, GEDmatch will work with a browser. And we know that Ancestry does not have a browser. That's its major weakness. Today, we're going to draw most of our examples from MyHeritage, but a few others with a few other, uh, uh, few others of those companies too. So let's look. I'm going to first of all show you what we're going to come to. This is kind of jumping ahead. And jumping ahead means once we get things laid out the way we want them on our computer with the Excel program, here we have a situation where up at the top, look at columns A, B, C, D, the rest of them. Column C says we're working on chromosome number three. And so you can see this is a screenshot of about our first, my first 30 matches in this, uh, this big related area of chromosome three. Now, as I look at some of these people, see where the small inobtrusive arrows are, notice that these people, I have already identified some of them, four or five of them, as members of my ancestor, the Perry family. Well, the fact is, some of these people have such large segments and they are kind of also sharing that segment with a lot of other people. And so here we, we have however many people there are. There are 30 or 40 people on this list. On the right-hand side, marked in red, I started by including known data 
about some of my higher scoring matches. And those are the ones that are listed that I have, I've, uh, I've typed them in their names, the, the Perry group, about five of them on the right hand side. And so the fact that there are these five Perry people says all these other people that are sharing the same, the same space on the same chromosome segments, they're all Perry people too. And so now look at that, can it be this easy? Like all of a sudden I have identified about another 35 people and placed them in their right part of where they go on the family tree. Now we're going to now take a step back because we've got to get to that point of where we're able to do that kind of analysis. So now this is the question, how do we get to that good data? Now my heritage is going to go part way with this. We might have to go another step or two at a time. So let's go through the process a step at a time and we'll, and we'll have some examples along the way. So here we are with, we've gone to my heritage. And so here on the DNA tab up above, I'm, I'm kind of clicking on that and it, that opens that up. I'm now in their world of DNA. On the left-hand side, you'll see that they have given me the scores and names and information about my top scores. There's a Darlene, there's a David, they are both second cousins of mine and they're getting good scores just like a second cousin gets. Now go over to the right hand downward arrow where the ellipse is. Click on that ellipse and then you have some choices. And the one choice where I have the arrow says export shared DNA segment information for all DNA matches. That's what we want MyHeritage to do, and that is their special tool. So that's where we're going to click, and what happens? We get a message, and they say to us, we are exporting the shared segments with all of your DNA matches list. So, so now you just sit tight for about two minutes because there's a lot of stuff that they're going to send you. And so then they send the message and see up near, near the top with that small arrow, they say, they give me my name and they say, here, we're sending you those matches. It takes about two minutes because I've got about 10,000 matches on my heritage. So, oh, and then they send you on the right-hand side, see that they're saying, Dear James, here's a zip file for you with all of these, all of this matching information. All right, now you're gonna click to open the file. So that's what we do. And here is the first page of what we get. And you see, here's more information about Darlene and more information about David. They're my top two scoring people. But now look at Darlene, she's matching me in about 10 different uh, chromosomes. And then when you look at, uh, go over four or five, uh, the column next to the right, uh, that's how, that's the length of those segments. So she has a 26, a 46. She's, she's really matching me really solid on several of those chromosomes with smaller CM numbers, six and seven, and some of them on some of the others. This is an Excel file that they have laid out for you. And they have laid out, it laid it for me in for all 10,000 of my matches. And, and they arrange it from highest to lowest. Now that's not the way we want it. So we need to rearrange this data I'm going to remove some columns that we don't necessarily use. And then I'm going to delete all of the scores that are smaller than 10, because I just want really good solid scores. And then, then we're going to sort the data 
Instead of by people, we're going to sort it by chromosome. But I want you to save this large file. I'll show you that this will come in handy later. Now, I know some people don't especially care to work with Excel. Maybe you haven't been doing it very much. Uh, you know, about the time we get, get happy with PowerPoint or something, then here's another thing that we have to be familiar with. But it isn't really that bad. And they have good instructions. And if necessary, you can get help from, from your own local techie person or you can go to Google and Google will tell you exactly what steps do you take to sort the data to, to do other things there. Now we want to rearrange this data by chromosome because we want to look at each chromosome, just like I showed you in that preview example. But to get there, it's going to be a two-step process. First, we're going to sort on the C column, that's the one that, that has chromosomes. And then we're going to arrange our data by the chromosomes. And then we'll do some sorting within each chromosome. Third bullet, we're also going to wipe out some columns and we're going to add a couple others. Here's our first step. Step number one, I have now said, I want the data arranged not by each individual, not by each match, but rather I want it arranged by chromosome. And so you can see column C, this is a, a screenshot of chromosome number one. And they have arranged it uh, to, in this first step, they've arranged it by the people who have the highest scores. And and that means they have not looked at the chromosome going from one end of the chromosome to the other. So that means we're going to reshuffle in a moment again. But, but for starters, I want you to see what we have here. We have a big bunch of people who have matches on chromosome one. Go over to column A, B, C, D, all the way to column I. And there you'll see their total centimorgan scores. That's the way they have listed it. And so like here's a 123, 119, and, and then several other really good high scores. Then I have added some columns, one right next to that, in the case of where maybe I kind of knew about what relationship these people are, and I would mark down that they are a third cousin. What branch of the family? That's my next column that I've added. And so this first guy, he is a third cousin. I know who he is. I have seen his, um, his family tree. He is, uh, it's on my father's side of the house. He's in the Wessling family. And so, but going down that column, you can see that I have several other representatives from different family groups that are somewhere in chromosome number one. So, so what we've gone that, that far. Now we're going to go a little further because we need one more sort. And we have, so far, we've arranged the data by chromosome, but now we want to adjust the presentation so that we can see the matching data as we move across each chromosome and imagine that you have, have laid out a chromosome left to right and it has number values kind of like from you start with number one and go whatever however far and whatever the larger numbers are and so we're going to resort that data in each chromosome by column D, let's go back and look at column D. That's the start location. And so we're going to, to put everybody in the first start location and then the next one, the next one, so that we have everybody in sequence as we move across the chromosome. So we're going to 
present the data beginning at the lowest segment starting number. And then as we get other numbers, and I call it moving from left to right in the chromosome. And I think at least that's an understandable way to look at it. So now some of these people will have different sized matching segments. Some are smaller or larger. So there's going to be some overlap, but we can work with that. That's okay. So here we are, we have now done the new sort. And in fact, for convenience, I've, I've made a separate file for each chromosome. Now you could have all of them right there, chromosome one, two, et cetera, but I've, I've chosen to make it into one for each of the 22. So here in my example, look over there at, at column C, we are working with chromosome number 13. I've kind of picked that out because it's a chromosome that I'm familiar with the fact that some of my Ellifritz people, see, I've marked them on the right, a bunch of Ellifritz people who are all in chromosome 13. And so that means very probably a lot of these other people will also be Ellifritz people. All right, now, after that new sort, or maybe even before the new sort, I've added some columns. In fact, I've already talked to you about some of those columns. Uh, going across the top, column H, I, have, I kind of thought it'd be useful if I segregated my Baker people. I don't have that many of them because uh, more of my people are from my mother's side. And so then the next column, I've marked down their total score of, of people. And so this works mainly for the really high scores. And then if I, ha if I have a good handle on what relationship they are, that I've, I've built a column for that. And then what branch of the family? And then a couple other things over here. So, um, Marked in red, this is an example of our final data arrangement for each chromosome. The start column is the key sorting item. And in column in uh, chromosome 13, I have 142 matches. And that's what we would see in that group. And in fact, momentarily, we will look more at some of these people. Now the added column data, well, I just told you about some of that. That's, that's where I added in some key data, like uh, the scores of my higher scoring people. And then I identified my father's side matches. And I think I only have maybe six or 8% from that side. And this is because they came to America much later than my mother's people. They came from Germany along about 1850. So they've been here 150, 180 years, but the other, the Tracy's, they've been here much longer. So, uh, and then I, I told you about those things for bullet three and four. Now, one other column, remember last time we talked a month ago, we talked about my heritage and the clusters that they have and how they give us information and they sort out who are our major cluster people. And of course they do that because they know who matches who on what chromosome. And so I added a, a column to pick that data up. Now, the third bullet is just kind of a, kind of a for your information thing that I have learned it's easier to sort the matches to add, it's easier to add the data before you sort it all out. So take that for what it's worth. Now we want to set up some columns for future use too, because that's where we're going to define our triangulation group number. And each one is going to be its own unique one with its own unique identity. 
And maybe we'll be fortunate enough to decide to define who that donor ancestor is. And so we'll set up columns for that. And then I have a column for shared matches because that's always going to be an extremely helpful item. And then just because I wanted another column for any special notes or remarks, whatever I might be thinking of that I don't want to lose that information. So that's all there. So this becomes kind of a big Excel chart. Now, just as a reminder for you and about chromosome nine, you probably know all this information. There's uh, 22 of the chromosomes and the way they're measured, the way they're laid out, by definition, number one is the largest and longest. And then each one has a slightly smaller size all the way down to number 22. In my case, I have found some chromosomes that have maybe 300 people matching them, some others, not so many. And there might be some empty areas. This is just a picture of looking at chromosome one, how big and long it is, number two, not quite so long, and so on. A word about the pink and the blue, that's the mother's side and the father's side, because each chromosome may presumably have both kinds, and you don't have any way to tell which it is, you, because the, the way the scorekeeping system works, uh, they just don't tell you. But of course, we have ways to sort that out because if we know a few people who are on the mother's side or the father's side, and we know who they have for their shared matches, then we can pretty well figure out who are the pink and the blue, and it's based on the shared matches. And I just told you that my Tracy people came to America much earlier, so I have a lot more of them. There are going to be three different strategies that we talk about that may help be very helpful for you. Any one of the three, you can take your pick. You can get good, good service out of each of those three strategies. First strategy is that you're going to key your data on the really high scoring matches. Happily, my heritage tells you what the size of the largest, the largest segment for each person, for each one of your matches. So you can quickly look at these. Number two, because they have, uh, at my heritage has laid your clusters out for you, that gives us a jump start. And so we can analyze based on those clusters and where they fit in them with a particular chromosome. A third method is that we're going to go through one by one, each of those chromosomes and start them from top to bottom and, and decide who are the triangulated groups for each one? So we're going to look at strategy one and then two and then three. So number one, looking at the high scoring matches, and this means the matches with the longest segments, which oh, usually they'll, they'll probably work out also to be, uh, be the people who have the highest total scores. So, Suppose I find a match, he has a segment that is over 50 centimorgans. That says that guy is solid as a rock. And it says that there are a lot of people who are within his same range, probably he has shared matches with them and they are getting their data, their DNA from the same source. So this strategy, permits you to focus on a specific family branch. Now, here I have my list. This is about my top 30 or so scores. And so just like we had before, here's Darlene and David and some of the rest of them. 
for the score column, I put not only their total score, but the longest segment. Darlene gets a 54, David a 44, and that whole big bunch, they're getting a really good long segment. In fact, even down there in the ones, uh, the next tier and the next tier, they have good solid, big long scores that, uh, that are for sure, uh, they're going to be accurate. So, so those, those total scores, uh, the, the long segment score will really be useful. And then I, I've put other stuff in here too, but for now we're just looking mostly at that long score. And then maybe go over and look in the right-hand column because now I know which major family branch that those, those people are interested in and connected with. So, so now here, this is what we're going to do. We're going to analyze some of these long segments. And so uh, third bullet, like if a segment has a score of more than 40, that's really a good area to look at because there's going to be a big bunch of other matches within that same segment area. And very probably they're going to come from the same source. Here is an example. Here's David, where the top arrow is. He's big on chromosome number nine. That's where I got this screenshot. So go across to his, the three different arrows, the starting area, the concluding area, and then column F, that's his score of 44. That means that his score, that particular segment, is going to encompass about 30 or 40 people below him, say the next 25 or so matches. Now, I, I know that he descends from my mother's people. He, he is a second cousin. He descends from Harmon Tracy, my great grandfather. And it means that all those 25 or so people below him, we can bet that they are solid Tracy people. We can double check and double verify because each one of those people should have a shared match with David. And I'll tell you, they do. And so, because I've done that exercise and all those people are solid they're all good Tracy people, and that's where they match. And that means all of those people have a common ancestor in that area. Now to go even below there, here I've got another person coming up um, where the second uh, left-hand arrow is. There's Melissa, and she has a score of 41. She's another Harmon Tracy person. And, and there was, I had identified another early Tracy person in between. And so these are just all Tracy people, no question about it. And that's where the, they're in a particular branch of the family. So that's the payoff for that long segment analysis, one by one you can go through and pick off some of your long segment people and you can look at who they are, who they're, where they're matching and you can identify first bullet, probably the next adjacent 20 or 30 matches very quickly. And that's just going to work really nice. Now, just as we did that with David, we can do that you know, I can do that for another 30 or 40 people who have really good long segments. And if I know where they are, which branch of the family. Now I give you a little caution here and it is in this world of the pink and the blue. There might be some matches within a certain segment range that are not shared matches because they descend from the other side of the house. If there are people who are in David's area, the, his chromosome, 
to his segment of that chromosome, but they don't match him, they might be on the Baker side of the house because he is on my mother's side. Nevertheless, really good payoff for that strategy number one. Coming up on strategy number two, now this is where we take a jump from what my heritage has already done it, done for us. And that's where they gave us all of those different clusters. And so they cluster people, anybody who scores higher than 30. And so in my case, they gave me 20 clusters, a total of 110 people. So I have a pretty good start with those people. Now, in order for them to, to, uh, to define a cluster, they have to find, they say, at least three of them. So we're going to work with different clusters. Now, you may remember that MyHeritage has this special tool, and it is the auto cluster thing. You push it three or four buttons, and that's one of their tools, the auto cluster and then they give you your list. And so here I've copied the names of my people who are in cluster number one, two, three, four, and so on. And then I've marked down also in some cases where I know that they might be either Ella Fritz people or Perry or whichever branch of the family. And so, and then I've also noted that that cluster goes with a particular chromosome. So like take, take a look where the arrow is for cluster, not cr cluster, it is, uh, it, yeah, cluster number four. Here's a bunch of names of people, Carlson, Compton, et cetera. And I know that is an Elifritz family group. And I know that they are big on chromosome 14. And so that's the kind of information that you have to start with. And now you can even go further and now you can go and dig in to chromosome 14. And so that's what I've done in this case. I had identified over there seven different people in that chromosome. And so I've listed them, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And notice that they're all in chromosome 14. And you can see they're kind of overlapping, like different ones. Look at that number two. That guy has uh, go over two or three columns, and you'll see 55.6. That is the size of his long chromosome. And so, of course, he is going to cover that same ground for about the next 20, 25 people. And in some cases, you can see I've marked on the right-hand column, I've marked down the names and, and basic data for about 10 of those people that I already knew were Ella Fritz family people. And of course, the others are too. And so I can now add everybody else in that group. So, so if, of course, I just gave you this example for, for one of the clusters, but it'll work just as well. I could have done that for any one of my other 2019 clusters. And so each one of those would have been really a useful exercise to identify another big good chunk of people. Now here is strategy number three, and this is maybe the most interesting one and the most detailed. And so I'm saying this is for the super diligent people. You go through each chromosome, left to right, top to bottom, and there is where you're going to look for your triangulated groups. And you're going to say, who's the donor in each case, which means which family group are we talking about? So to do this, you're going to go through one by one, each one of the entire array of chromosomes 
And when you have done that, you have gone a long way toward constructing your own personal genome. And so that takes a certain amount of effort. I know Jim Bartlett's second bullet there, he's, he, he, he's sort of, I call him the father of segmentology because he has done so much work in this area and he has built his own genome. He blogs, he gives advice to people. And in fact, it was really his uh, advice that I took to really kind of get into this. So once you have constructed your genome, then you're going to know which area of which chromosome goes to which ancestor, which family group. And that means that then you can readily place any of your new people. Today, we obviously don't have time to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through one of them just to show you that uh, although it would be overwhelming to do 22 of them, we'll do one of them for number 14. And I've chosen one that I had kind of a good jump start on. And so, so that's going to be maybe kind of useful. Now, I've played around with this business on a number of chromosomes and with different sites. And so you see in the right-hand column, uh, I have uh, I've have some of this information that comes from FTDNA or GEDmatch, and now a fair amount also from my heritage. The left hand says, which chromosome are we talking about? And in the middle there, which family branch is it that is going to be big in one or another of these chromosomes? So th th this kind of gives me a pretty good starting point. And probably maybe you have something like that going for you already as well. Uh, in looking at individual chromosomes, sometimes I make notes and have detail and like here was chromosome number 21 and I've marked down where the people were, where they stopped and started and who belongs to whom and all that kind of stuff. Here was a similar exercise on number 13 that worked out just extremely well. And, but now we're going to do our own analysis and we're going to take chromosome number 13 that we just looked at <clears throat> just a minute ago. And I'm going to find for you down the way here, a nice person named Christy, who scores a big 51, and that might really help us. Now, these are Ella Fritz people. And so Christy is a third cousin of mine, because we all to, together, we go back uh, you, you can see Elijah Elifritz, where the arrow is, he's four generations out. So if other people match me and he is also an ancestor of theirs, they're my third cousins. So here I have, I have identified center section. I have identified at least four people. Now where my left-hand arrow is, there's Christy. And those smaller arrows go across the page a little bit, and you see she has a 51.9. I mean, she is absolutely solid as an Elifritz descendant. And because she's in the same area as a bunch of those other people, we can pretty well bet that they're going to be Elifritzes as well. Now, Although Christy is big and, uh, and the Elifritz group is big, there are actually a number of people there who are, who are in that left-hand edge of the chromosome who, who are left earlier, they start earlier than Christy does. And so like that first one, see uh, column number, uh, the A column, where we go down number one to zero five six seven, 
about those first four people, they're all starting at the same place and different ones, they go 13 points, 10, 12, not, not really big numbers, but they're all covering that same area. And so they're in the same segment of that chromosome. And so on the right-hand column for the triangulated group, I'm saying they are in what I'm now calling triangulated group number one. They're different than Christy because she hasn't yet joined up in chromosome 13. She comes in a little later. So, and so those first four people who all start at the same point, the first one, he's got the, the largest score and the others are all within his score his score of 13. So I'm making him the base person. So in the Q column, see he's he, the, the triangulated group, the TG, I'm making him base number one and the others are members of that group number one. So that's where we are with, with number one. Now there are also some people, about three or four more of them who, uh, who seem to come from some foreign country and they all kind of share with one another. I don't know who these people are, they're unknown to me, but again, their scores are left of where Christy joins number 13. So I'm making them group number two and I'm making Christy number three, and I'm making her the base person for number three. And then you see going down in that right-hand column, there's a big bunch of people that are in that same group as Christy. So that screenshot listed about the first 35 matches out of my total people for, for number 13. And they are arranged now by start location as we move across the segment from left to right. And our goal is to decide who fits in which triangulated group. My spoiler message here is there's going to be seven of them. And so we can see Christy is just a few spots from the start. So Number one, I, I told you about number one, about those four people who have the very same start location. The first guy had the higher score. I called him the base person and the others are members of his group number one. And so they're, they're all part of, you might call it the same cluster I don't know who these people are, so I have to say they're unknown for now. Group number two, those were those three people who came there from some foreign country and they match each other, but they don't match anybody else in number 13. And their start and end locations are just a little earlier than the start for the Elifritz group. And I thought that was kind of interesting that all three of those people live in Europe. But again, I don't know what group they belong to. I'm marking them unknown. But now here's a group that we really know about and that we can put to good use. And this is this large Elifritz group. And this, this is with Christy who scored 51 and all those people down the way from Christy, they're, they're all in her same group. And in fact, bullet number three, it'll turn out that Christy will have matches with people all the way down from number 10, all the way down to 111. This is really a large group and they're all descended from that Elifritz family. Now, remember, our, our uh, minimum score here is 10. So talking more about people in the Elifritz group, we get uh, several people that I already knew who they were. 
and I had already identified them as elephrixis. And then now all of a sudden it looks like I'm going to get another 80 or 100 people. I had not recognized any Baker family members in this chromosome 13. And indeed, my, my father's side just don't represent that many of the total. And so I didn't think any of them were going to be mixed in here with number 13. Nevertheless, to be super safe, I checked each of the supposed Christie matches, her shared matches, and found they were solid all the way down to number 32. Now let's look back here at that number C going all the way down left-hand column to number 32. And then in my right-hand column, number 333, they were all good. Until we come to a guy who is an anomaly, a person who didn't show up as a shared match for Christie. His name is Jan Philip Tebby. He's got a good score, a total of 30. And right here on number 13, he scores 17. But yet that 17 is within the same area, the same numbers, the start to end group of where Christie's score is. So why, is, why are they not matching? He, Tebby, does not have a shared match with Christie. What was the matter? How can it be? In fact, this is a big puzzlement. So let's look at Tebby's profile on MyHeritage and see what we can learn. Top arrow, we're now we've clicked on Tebby. And so now I'm gonna click on his shared matches. He's got a bunch of them. And his first match, this is where it really hits me in the head. I know who EW is. He is my third best match on, on my heritage, but he is on my father's side of the house. He is my third cousin, a member of the Wessling family. See, he uh, underneath the red mark, see where it says his score. For me, it was 122. Now he doesn't match quite so well with Tebby, they match for a score of 14. So, you know, that's, that's still realistic because they're good matches. And then Tebby has some other matches too, but none of them are the Elephrix matches. And then down the way, he's got a match with a guy named Alan. I match Alan, he matches him. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Alan later on. But for now, let's go back now and take a look at my third cousin, E.W. And E.W. had already been on Ancestry, so I knew him. And on Ancestry, Ancestry has a rule that says to be a shared match, you've got to have 20 for your CM score. And that meant, even though he's a good third cousin, he only had shared matches with three other people. One is his son, Gary, and then a couple other people that I know who they are. They're in that same Wesling family. But now here, let's look at Tebby, because Tebby, good fellow that he is, he has posted his family tree that goes way back. And back there four or five generations, he is where the arrow is, two arrows, Hannah V. Loggi and Theodore V. Loggi. That name I know because E.W. and the rest of us connect with that family way back when. And it turns out because he, Tebby was such a good, a good fellow to put his family tree in, those people lived only about five miles away from my people in, 
in a small village in Germany. Almost undoubtedly, I know who Tebby is and where he fits in the family tree. He's on my father's side. But that connection was really a surprise. Tebby is likely a fifth or sixth cousin, but he's scoring higher than we expect a fifth cousin to score. But nevertheless, he's got those shared matches. And he, so now over here uh, on chromosome 13, EW didn't show up. And so we're going to go back now to the piece of paper that I showed you. I said, save this one. That was the original one. But now here we've got EW, all of his information, where the arrows are. See, on chromosome 13, he scores 9.5. I had set the cutting point at 10, and he didn't make the cut if I had if I had not set it so high, but but that's why he's there. And yeah, he's on number 13 also. Now, the difference between E.W., my third cousin, on either my heritage or on ancestry, he has more shared matches, see, by far on my heritage. And that's because the cutoff is 10 not 20. And so when, when we work with ancestry, they're much more conservative, see? And so that's where the enlightenment comes in, that the huge difference is that ancestry, who's, which sets the threshold for 20 for the shared match, that's going to make it much more difficult to identify fifth or sixth cousins. Now let's come back where we were. We had the Elephrits group. And so, so now that we're down there to Tebby and beyond, some of the people beyond Tebby, some of them match Tebby, and some of them still match the Elephritses. So look at that right hand column that has. TG number three and number four. That's the, some of them are Elephritzes and some of them are Tebbies. And so I've, I've marked down which ones match Tebby. And I've also noted that a lot of these people show that they are, even today, they're living in Germany. Okay, now we go all the way down here. Um, on the left-hand side, you're going to see an arrow to number 46 person, that's Alan, and we're going to take a hard look at him momentarily. But let's consider that Tebby group. I want to be sure you know what we're talking about here. These are the people who coexisted with the Elephants people on number 13, but we had no way to sort out who were the pink and who were the blue, except when you play shared matches. And so that's the way we figured it out. Now, this guy that we eventually came to partway down that list, number 46, Adams had a good score. He matched Tebby. So he's connected with that Wesling family. And he didn't connect with, uh, with Christie or the Elephritzes at all. But I thought it would be better to make a special group with the Allen people, and that's group number five. And so notice in the right-hand column, there's a bunch of people who do not match Christie, but they do match Allen. And remember, Allen matches EW and my Wesling people, and he matches Tebby. So now continuing on down, we've got a lot of people in group number five in the right hand side, but this is a wonderful example of the pink and the blue. Now here, this Adams had a 31 point segment. And so, so he covered, he, uh, he coincided with a lot of people, 52 people in that group number five. And then second bullet, I thought this was interesting that 
so many of those people live even today in European countries. And so it could be that many of those Westling people just did not move all that far away from their Northwest German homeland. But in no place else had I run across that many people who were not Americans. Of course, it's mostly Americans who take these, these DNA tests. Now, going further, here we have, well, we've talked about the group four and five people. And in the meantime, we're still getting some Ella Fritzes. So, so to wrap it up here, Group number one and two, those were just four or five people, and they were low scorers, but I don't know who they are. They're in an unknown group for now. With the Elifritzes, there's like 44 people there, and we know who they match. We know that they are solid. We know similarly, even though it's the pink and the blue, the Westlings come from my father's side of the house. And so we have those groups. And how do they match me? Well, they're all Westlings. They're all way back where? Now you wonder, hey, the, some of these are really distant relatives. How can they score so well? And here is a, at least a partial answer. I have a case here of where here are three known relatives one of them is father, and then there's his granddaughter. So here's father, daughter, and granddaughter. But look at that right-hand arrow. He's scoring on that particular chromosome, 16-6. So is his daughter. And the granddaughter scores even more. But their scores are almost identical. And I think we often get that with people and that is an example of what happens throughout many generations. And it's why we can get some people who are maybe sixth or seventh cousins. Well, back to our analysis, it's all kind of downhill from here. We've done the big things. We've, we've explained about the pink and the blue. There's just a couple more groups and it turns out they're going to be unknown groups, but they match one another and that's group six and group seven. So I think the benefits of this, you get the idea that you can now really place a lot of people in, and there's just no question about it, it works. So here's our conclusions. Uh, well, of course, I've got to blow the horn and say segment analysis is indeed valuable. Uh, we're going to identify people in different branches of the family. My heritage really helps, I think, more so than the other companies this way. We talked about formatting that data Excel style. We talked about the long segments, the cluster groupings, and then our third strategy was to go through each chromosome and figure out those triangulated groups. So we have come to the end. I think I'm a minute or two over time. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Are you still with us? You are. Yes, hi. Um, if you have any questions um, in the audience, please send them now. Thank you, James. That was a wonderful um, webinar. We'll give them like a minute if they have any. Okay, now we can see us. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't seem like any. Oh, there is. Okay, oh, Betty says thank you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which will be um, on August 11th, with Catherine Grant on what to do when you see the red exclamation mark resolving data problem errors in family search family tree. Um, 
a recording of this webinar will be made available next week, the latest Monday. You can view that on our YouTube channel or our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at FHL underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.